So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bruin. So yes, I'm uh, Dariba, and I'm here to talk about uh, rail interruptions and uh, history of the regulation of, of railways. Uh, you can advance the slide once. So this work that uh, I'm presenting today, uh, yeah, it looks like it's working. Thanks a lot, sir. Some of it I did with uh, colleagues at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, James Nolan's actually kind of our ag econ expert on grain transportation. He, he consults a lot with the uh, federal government on changing policy. Uh, and him and I and uh, Troy Schmitz and uh, Richard Gray worked on a paper in 2017. But we have been involved in some of the uh, regulatory debates that have happened since then. Uh, and Narendra Malagoda and Barry Prentice and I worked on a project that was funded from, by the Manitoba Crop Alliance. Thank you, the Manitoba Crop Alliance, for that support. And thanks for your support of our uh, supply chain researcher, Alan Krita Goswami, who's going to have a whole career kind of focused on price shocks and tied to especially weather disruptions. So thank you for that. And thank you also to supporting some of our students who got internships at the Manitoba Crop Alliance, which really helped them understand sort of the policy debate in Canada. Yes, thank you. Now I'm, st now I'm stuck again. <laughs> yes, I'll let, I'll let you... So this is uh, our supply chain. We have, we have farmers who put seed in the ground in uh, the spring, uh, not knowing exactly how much they're going to produce, not knowing the value of the crop that they're going to sell at the end of the year. So there's a random shock, disruption to the system in just the seeding decisions, and then in the weather regarding the production that they face. They take off the crop, they sell it to the uh, elevator, so that's a, you know, dumping it into an elevator system, and then it moves, the elevators load grain cars. The el elevator loads grain cars, uh, the, the grain cars, that's grain cars moving through the uh, Rocky Mountains, gets to the, dominantly, predominantly, they go to the Vancouver port and they unload. This is a, a terminal in Vancouver getting uh, cars unloaded. The, they are unloaded by the uh, railway onto the, uh, into the terminal. The terminal takes a leg out to a boat and fills up that uh, um, boat. And that, that's where a whole bunch of the market trades. The international market trades at free on board in some port. And Vancouver is a nationally known pricing point. Once it's in that position, you can click the slide one more time for me. I will try it. So that's the international customer. Once it's in that position, for relatively low amounts, you can move to ports all around the world. So that, that's the position that we that's the position that we kind of uh, tend to focus on in terms of uh, the movement of grain. The number of players in the system, there's about 70,000 grain farmers delivering uh, into the system. Six firms control about 80% of the uh, elevator movement and the uh, terminal activity in Vancouver. And two firms control 100% of the movement into the Thunder Bay and Vancouver ports, and they control 95% of all the movement on the railways. And we were especially concerned about uh, local monopoly rents that the CN could collect in the south, sorry, CN in the north, and CP in the, in the south. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is just showing that, that the importance of the Vancouver port. Next, next slide. One more. <laughs> okay, this is the, the players the, the, the grain companies that are involved in the system. So you can see dominant position of Viterra in terms of total capacity. The, the, the capacity that has really increased since some of the regulations that, that came into place in 2000 uh, uh, have, have come in. But there's also been changes in the Vancouver, Vancouver terminal ports. We have about a million tons of uh, capacity to flow through the Vancouver port. And we have about 8 million tons of, uh, or 9 million tons now, 
of capacity in the prairie elevators. But you can see the firms that dominate here. G, uh, p and bought the Louis Dreyfus capacity, and so they're now the third largest uh, firm in terms of a primary elevator capacity. Uh, Cargill's still a leader in the Vancouver terminal capacity. Uh, go to the next slide, please. But you see there is some concentration. So why we get concentration of firms, there are economies of networks, so the, the more parts of a network that connect an individual customer to a final user, the more that that network becomes a greater value to everybody connected, and the more efficient it is as an asset if it's moving lots of, in, in the railway sense, in telephone sense, moving lots of activity through the, the lines that they're being used, makes those lines more efficient per unit of, of time or per unit of ton that moves through the system. So overall in the grain supply chain, we're quite concerned with economies of scale. So if the, all the infrastructure is being used, the more times it turns over, the lower the cost is per unit because it's spreading that fixed cost over more and more tons. So more tons moving through a system that's at a current size, the lower the cost is of the whole system. Okay. So now it's, uh, sorry, Econ 101, I have to put up a graph because I'm an economist. Uh, but I wanted to get back to that, that port price where the, where the grain is in the, in the ship. That's the world price that we could get facing world, world demand for our goods. And recently, super high prices in, in uh, Vancouver for both wheat and canola. So that, that price is the best that we can get from the world market. And what's going on with the, that, the bottom line, that's the world price less the cost of moving that grain. And as you can see, as we get to lower quantities, we're the, under the current infrastructure, the fewer tons we move through the system, we have an overall higher cost. So in terms of, a, of an efficient move, and what could get reflected back to the farmer is that world price minus those costs. If we had perfect competition, everybody within the supply chain were competing right down to their costs, we would get out to that QC. So if we had lots of competition, that could be what, uh, what we ended up with. Now, can we get the next slide, please? If somebody within the supply chain has the ability to set rents, and people have argued this about the railways, especially when they're colluding sometimes even in terms of moving grain through Vancouver Port, they could decide to set a specific rate. And it would still be in their interest. It does decrease, it increases their cost. All right, we, we would expect that they're moving less tons if they, if they charge higher rates over the long run. It's gonna send a lower price signal to the farmer and that will decrease the quantity through the system. But even with, even, even with the, those, those cost differences, go one up for me. Yeah, so even with those cost differences, we would have a, a rate that they're getting from the world minus their cost versus the rate that they're charging to the farmer. They would make significant profits on lower tonnages. So this is the concern with railway movements around the world, that they're afraid that the railways will do this. They will slow down the tons moving through the system. Now can I get the next slide? So this is the history of... The, Railways around the world are regulated, even in the United States they were, railway, they were regulated, but in Canada the regulation started when the CPR put their railway through uh, the um, Crow's Nest Pass, and there was a deal made between the federal government and the CPR that they would charge low rates to farmers uh, in compensation for the federal government's help in getting them some of that track built. And that rate was stayed at what it was for about up to the 1980s. So the railways were getting very low returns from grain and because of that didn't invest very much in grain infrastructure and the federal government, Canadian Wheat Board at, in, when, when it came around, those guys were making investments in rail trying to make it cheaper for, grain for the railways to move grain at all and that's why there was a bunch of ownership of cars in the system by governments. 1980, 1980s, there was lots of regulation in the United States as well. 1980s, the Staggers Act starts to deregulate the railways in the United States, and they see that 
the railways start to be viable companies again, and they start to make investments in their own infrastructure, and they start to allow some, comp some of the competition between the firms starts to improve the actual service, and in some places actually decreased rates by deregulation. So that put a bug in the ear of everybody in Canada and said, we, we should look at deregulating our system. And the first thing they did was convert the, the crow's nest into a subsidy so that the railways were getting the real cost of moving grain as a payment. And, and then the farmers, because they were used to low rates, were getting a subsidy on that move. So they converted a fixed rate that the, the railways had to charge into a subsidy the federal government paid to cover that, that movement. So that was the first thing we started to see some cost rationalization in the in 1980s. And then between 84 and 96, the, the subsidy starts to shrink. And there's also debate on whether or not the service is good enough, given how much we're paying for it. And so there were reviews. One of the reviews was by Clay Gilson from my department in, in the 80s, trying to figure out how to dis dismantle the crow rate itself. Uh, and then uh, Judge Esty and, and Arthur Kruger had a review of the whole system in, in, in uh, the 1995, 96, 97. And in the Kruger review, they suggest, let's set some high limit, the MRE that caps the amount that the, the uh, sorry, uh, if Reg Dick is in the office, he hate me, you ever use the word cap? It was a a certain unit for every, a certain amount for every ton moved called the maximum revenue entitlement. It's an average rate for every ton moved. It's not a cap on revenues. They can make as many revenues as they want if they move a lot of tons, but on average, they can't overcharge the farmer. So they said, we'll set it really high. At, I think at, then it was about $35 a ton. Within a few years, it never got away from that cap. So the railway started to capture that amount right away. But the other thing, so it gave the, the railways some incentive to make their own investments right then. The other thing that it did was that it allowed the railways to charge different rates to different firms. So uh, prior to that, the, that regulated rate, even though it was covering the costs, anybody that was the same distance from port got exactly the same rate. And the railways were saying, some of our companies are delivering, setting up a, a movement that's much cheaper for us to move than others. We want to be able to price discriminate between those two firms. So that was another thing that the MRE allowed. Uh, and so in 2000, the MRE gets set up, and that sets this change in the regulation. And we're going to explore what the MRE did to the system. Uh, but there was service complaints in 2013. We had a surprisingly large crop to some folks. We had a huge amount of grain being pushed into the system. There was concern. And if we, would, if we would at least deregulate the rates, we could get the, the, the railways to increase their service. Uh, in 2016, when this is the, the spring that I'm in Saskatchewan, and the, the transportation minister says he's going to remove the MRE, the farmers asked us to look at it, and that's where some of the research that I'm going to talk about uh, started. Next slide, please. So this is the, just to talk about what the MRE did, I'm, I'm going up to 2017 here because there was a, a major shift in, in 2018. But what you can see from 2000 to 2017, there was a drastic reduction in the number of elevators. So the number of people you could go to decreased and it might have hurt your competition in a local area. But the overall capacity of the system actually went up. So we shut down small elevators and built much bigger ones. So our overall capacity increases from 7 to 8.3 million tons of capacity. And the number of times those prairie elevators were turning over increased a lot from 4.8 times a year to 6.4 times a year. And actually, in the middle of the 2013, the entire, or during 2013, the Alberta assets turned over 8.4 times. So the sector did respond in 2013. Some of that was based on the regulation that the federal government imposed on the railways, and their cheapest moves were from Alberta, and so that was an incentive to move a lot of grain out of Alberta, and there were people trucking from Saskatchewan to Alberta. But there was incredible increases in the turnover and the efficiency of the prairie elevators. There, there was also an increase in the turnover in the Vancouver elevators, from an average in 2000 of about 9.5 to 20.5. That's 2017. 
And we had an increase in the number of elevators by 67% of the number of elevators with 50 car slots. Next slide, please. Okay, so we had that big improvement and then we still continue to, and we're, we're, we're discussing the MRE. I'm getting calls about the MRE from Transportation Canada already now. There, there is under review again right now. But in 2017 and 18, when there was some service complaints, they were discussing changing the system. Uh, they looked at dismantling the MRE again. They chose not to do that, but they did put an incentive within the system that split the way um, railways could collect on their own investments. So when the railways in, uh, invested in, in grain cars, in the previous MRE, if CN invested in a rail car, and that and therefore were uh, eligible to increase the MRE because of that particular cost, CP got to increase their rates too. So if you invested, your competitor actually got to collect a higher rate. So there was actually no real incentive to improve your system uh, relative to your competitor. When they split that up so that if CN invested in, in cars, they could collect on some of that, that, uh, that cost, uh, all of a sudden there was investment. So we want that, that happened in Bill C-49 in 2018. So we want to evaluate what happened between 2017 and now because of that change in the bill. Next slide, please. Thank you. So right away, there was investment in railways. 3,000 cars to CPR, uh, 3,500 3, uh, cars to CN, and CN also helped some of their customers get 950 cars. Next slide, please. So what happened between 2017 and 2022? We saw actual increase in the number of elevators. We saw the increase in the capacity go from 9.3 to 9.4. The turnover rate stayed the same on the prairies. The turnover rate in Vancouver has actually gotten down. And part of what has happened there is G3 came onto the system during this period. And so some of the assets there are not very efficient. They're not getting very many tons moved. So given that capacity of the and the graph I had in Vancouver, the turnover rate, this, all that we, the uh, Quorum Corp can measure for us, has actually been down. The highest it ever got was in 2016. Uh, but we see a 26% increase in the number of cars that will move, or number of elevators that can move at least 100 cars, a 200% doubling of the number of uh, elevators that had loop track between 2017 and 2022. In, in 2000, there were no loop tracks. By 2017, there were some. And by, uh, as of the, 20, uh, the report of the Quorum Corp of 21-22 crop year, we were up to 37. So that change, the tweak in the investment that led to the elevator, sorry, the railways investing in better cars improved the efficiency of the entire system. Next slide, please. Oh. Okay, just this? Okay, so that's, this is just showing what happened. So in the Vancouver report, uh, we actually went, so the, the, from 2017 to 2018, we went above 22 million metric tons, which we hadn't done since, si there may have been 2008 when we had a very large crop and a large wheat uh, 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 movement and, and some capacity that shut down. We might have had more than this. So I'm not sure it was a record, but I think uh, the 2020, 21 was a record. So we got up to over 30 million metric tons moved through the Vancouver port in a single crop year. So after we invested in that capacity in the, in the cars, the terminals all became more efficient. We moved more grain through them. Uh, we did have a drop in 2021, but it wasn't because of the efficiency. It was the size of the crop. Just to get back to what the MRE does, so if we have perfect competition, we get to that the line where the world price minus the cost uh, matches our, uh, our supply from the farmer. So the farmer will supply that amount at that price, that price that they're getting right at the cross there. The MRE decreases that a little bit. It decreases the quantity a little bit, but it's really small relative to what a monopoly uh, uh, railway could do if it was completely unregulated. 
So the MRE is a little bit of pain, but the thing about it is, is that the railways now have an incentive to move as much grain through the system as possible. They will earn the MRE every, for every ton they move. Moving lots of grain through the supply chain makes the whole supply chain more efficient, and a more efficient supply chain means that they can reflect the world price back to the farmer at the lowest cost they can hit. They're, they're always going to have to give up the MRE, and, and the MRE could maybe be changed a little bit, but as a regulatory tool, something that does go up and down with real cost to the railways, for me, I think it was a really good solution to solving that, uh, the capacity in the system. Whether or not we would get better service if we were unregulated, remember that as soon as they were offered a, higher, a high rate, the MRE, uh, they went to it. So they did capture monopoly rents as soon as they did. From then till now, they had a chance, anytime they wanted to, to compete below that to get more business. They never did. All right? And they also had a chance to compete on service. They never did. I, I'm concerned that if we deregulate them, we would get any change in service. They could complain about service in the United States, and they're paying 50, 60 percent more in rates than us. All right. Uh, we tried to model how big this box could get if it was completely unregulated. So uh, me and James and Richard, we looked at the cost structures of the CNCP from their annual reports, tried to estimate the shape of that curve, and if they were allowed to be com manage it completely as a, a monopoly, we estimated that they would go, at the time MRE was $36, it's now closer to $50, but at the time, they would triple, they possibly triple the, the rents they would pull from the system, the, re the rate that they would charge to farmers. And farmer profits go down a lot because they're taking the wedge from the world price to what the farmer gets. That looks like a big number, going from 36 to 100, but I remind you that in uh, 2016, 2015, sorry, 2013, 2014, we did see basis between the export price and what the farmer got of more than $100 a ton. So the system has pushed $100 differences between the export price and the farmer onto the system when it was plugged up already. Now that's more the grain companies having uh, an allocation of cars that they can manage how they want. And I, I, I think, you know, the, they, were, they were given that allocation and there was nothing morally in, uh, wrong for them to make as much money from that allocation as they could, but the system was, you, were, you as farmers were willing to pay a really big rate to get it to export position. This is just showing uh, the canola crop in uh, Western Canada. So you can see what the, in 2000, the canola price was $290. 2013-14, it was $500. 2021-22, it was $1,000. And you can see what happened to the export bases. It was actually worse in 2013 than it was in 2021. Even though there was a really high world price, they were making it as cheap as possible to reflect that price back to the farmer. That was a good thing to send in terms of the world demand to the farmer to invest in their inputs to grow more grain. I'm just showing that prices have been basically up since the beginning of the MRE. So those higher prices, that makes the, the, uh, the wedge between the, um, the world price and uh, what they offer to the farmer, the, the profit maximizing wedge gets wider and wider the higher prices get. I think I modeled this. So the, that, that, this is showing if the world price goes up, uh, the price back to the farmer, even at, at a um, profit maximizing monopoly, they'll actually increase to farmers, but the wedge between the world price and what the farmer gets gets wider and wider. And when we modeled that, uh, you can see that, and we were you know, thinking 350 was a good world price in, in 2017, you can see that the rail rates, at 2000, in, in 2000 by the way, the $41 uh, premium that the, the MRE was, was pretty close to what they would have charged as a profit maximizing firm. By the uh, time it gets to 350, they would be charging really high numbers. Now, we, if they're charging that much, it starts to pay to truck grain to uh, Vancouver, so it's a, a ab abnormally, not probably very realistically high rate, 
but it starts to put pressure on the system. The incentive with the, with the, the railways is to increase rates quite a bit. Okay, so we talked about disruptions from players within the system. We get disruptions in the system because of what, who, who plants what and what grows during the growing season. So we get disruptions to the entire supply chain because of that. We get, we get disruptions in the winter on that movement through the mountains. If it's unsafe to move large car units, they have to decrease the number of cars that they'll put on some of the winter movements. Uh, and, and the weather, so the weather can affect the overall size. You can get surprise bumper crops like 2013. Uh, you can get a closure of an entire line, as we saw in Churchill. You can get washed out bridges and main lines, which happens quite often th through most growing seasons. And we actually saw very heavy, heavy weather wash out the Hope main line, and in the 2021, 20, washed out both the CN and CP when you had that big rain in the Fraser Valley. So we can have disruptions caused by the weather that we have to be prepared for within the supply chain, but we can also get disruptions that are man-made. And this is the work that Narendra uh, did while he, he started under uh, um, the supply chain management funds the um, Manitoba Crop Alliance gave us. Uh, and we looked at the first thing that happened, in February 2020, we thought we had this interesting experiment of, of barricade regulation uh, when, when the uh, uh, environmental and uh, indigenous groups were protesting a pipeline through uh, unceded territory in BC, and they started to barricade some of our railways. And we said, what's this going to do the, to the overall export position this year? And then we had another bad thing happen in 2020, the COVID uh, event, and we were concerned that it would have an increase on the overall demand, but we were wondering if it had any impact on the supply chain itself. And so, Narendra modeled export pace based on a, as many factors as he could think of that, that affect export pace. We built a model that included yearly effects, seasonal shocks, pricing effects that have an impact on the export pace. Then we put in a dummy for when the um, uh, uh, barricades were on. So February 2020 for about three weeks, the barricades were on and then COVID was on from March of 2020 to the end of the data set that we had. Uh, we, we did, there was an average negative effect from the barricades. It was too short probably to us to measure a significant impact, but the, the evidence was it had a negative impact, but relatively small. COVID's impact on the supply chain through 2020 was actually positive relative to all the other factors that could have shifted that export demand especially in the early weeks of 2020, of, of the COVID, we saw a big increase in the movement of exports. And later on, the, the, the anecdotal evidence was that it's because there was less demand for most of the other things that were moving on the railways, especially intermodal. There was just less retail uh, demand, and uh, there was less, for some of our other exports, there was less demand because the world economy was uh, uncertain. But grain demand for food through the COVID was steady and the railways had excess capacity, so they moved more grain because of COVID than before. That was positive and significant. Okay, so I just wanna thank you for your time. I do wanna talk a little bit about the, the legacy of, of uh, research on transportation at our department in agricultural economics at the University of Manitoba. So there were, actually I think, sure, there were people working on it before Gilson, but Gilson did work on the dismantling of the, of the crow rate back in the 80s. Uh, Colin Carter and Al Loins argued against uh, the, the wheat board being involved in, in the allocation of cars. Kraft, Turknowitz, and, uh, and uh, Furtan, uh, Kraft and Turknowitz both have a legacy within our department. Uh, they, they worked in keeping the wheat board in the system. Uh, Barry Prentice, by the way, Barry doesn't agree with me completely on MRE. He, he thinks that uh, there's enough competition and he, he, he argues in favor of deregulation sometimes. You can talk to him about an, another side of the story. And Barry puts on a conference every year in December looking at uh, rail transportation, grain transportation. He switched to an online version that now has, uh, uh, he posts the, the presentations. They're a very good overview of our system every year. And in, uh, he started his, this Fields on Wheels in 1995, and he, he's still going last December, and it's become a very good 
uh, resource in terms of understanding the system. In 2000, uh, Daryl Kraft passed away, and his friends and family started a fund that supports graduate student research, a student paper, and a lecture series on policy. And uh, I've got some, some uh, cards down here. If you're a fan of this kind of research, and if you want to see uh, lectures on this stuff, there is some uh, uh, paper down here from the family on how to uh, donate to that fund if you're interested. All right, that I think is the last slide. Oh, these are some of my sources. If you want to, that Quorum Corporation, a very good source of data on our system. The Canadian Grain Commission has pretty good data on our capacity and, our, and it's more up to date than Quorum in terms of regular movements. Uh, and then some of the other research that I uh, quoted uh, is there. All right, did I go too long? Sorry. Nope, okay. Perfect. okay. Okay. So, join me in thanking Dr. Bruin. Thank you. Thank and you. we have some time for questions. Any questions? Oh, up here. I'll just get you to hold on. I'm going to make noise. Would you like him to go back to those three slides with the canola receipts? Can you go back to the three slides with the canola receipts? Yes. Nope. <laughs> yeah, well, you had, you had numbers there. Where, so with that, without that regulation, don't you think the, when canola was $1,000 a ton, the railways would have yes. a significant yeah. amount more? So I yes. think it's good. I, I mean, we don't know for sure. So that, Barry Prentice disagrees with me. He thinks that we, we've got enough competition in some of those sections that we would compete at least close. Uh, but I, yeah, I absolutely think that if there's a thousand dollars, they can they can still give you a very good price. You produce just about as much quantity, and they can make three hundred dollars a ton instead of fifty dollars a ton. Yes, yeah, that's that's what we model. But you know, this is a dangerous place to play an experiment. Any other questions? Oh, I think I think it's moving grain now, and it's an interesting game that uh, one of the major shippers now owns the line or has a control of the line. So it might be a, a a time for Churchill to do better than it used to, because in the past, everybody who was moving grain through Vancouver had high prices. They wanted to make the profit on those Vancouver and Thunder Bay terminals. They didn't want to go into Van in, into Churchill, uh, and so I think you know with uh, Al Khatib and I think he's still invested in the line and has markets, that could actually maybe work very well, especially if the Northwest Passage opens up again and we get more, more boats into the port. Yes, for sure. Uh, again, Prentice disagrees with me. He thinks that if we should expand any movement it's in, in, uh, and if we should fix a port, it's at Prince Rupert. And he might be right there. Prince Rupert's asset is owned jointly and nobody has an incentive to move there because they got to share the profits with everybody else. So there's a problem with how the ownership has worked in, in Prince Rupert too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I didn't know this until. Uh, so the, the, the comment was, could we use railway as an efficient, decarbonized uh, transportation source? And the answer is yes. I don't know enough about that, that in engineering, but I do know that most tr uh, locomotion is actually running on an electric engine. They have a generator that makes electricity that runs an electric engine, so there's actually an efficiency within the system already uh, to use electricity. So I think, yes, that, would, that could work. It, just think about how expensive it is to fix a uh, breakdown in, uh, in, the, in the Rockies for electricity, though. Uh, so I, I know that the, in, the, in the Laker world, they're talking about using biofuels to run their boats, not atomic energy or not electricity yet. So they're, they're, they think there's enough uh, in terms of biofuels to run their system. But I don't know enough to answer your question, honestly. Any more questions?
Okay. Thank you. Have a good uh, rest of your ag days. Oh, there's a faculty of uh, Manitoba faculty uh, gathering today. Uh, I'll, I'll see you there if you're, uh, if you're, <laughs> if you're alumni.